Um, good morning, everyone. And uh, as chair of RUSI, it's my pleasure to welcome you here uh, this morning to our premises and to this important discussion and publication. And as you know, at, at RUSI, we are one of the leading defense and security think tanks in the world. And in the past, the illegal wildlife trade would probably not have featured heavily uh, on our agenda or among our publications. But sadly, the huge scale of this evil trade has implications for governance, for corruption, and indeed for human security. Um, it's a subject very dear to my own heart. Uh, when I served as Foreign Secretary, I convened the first intergovernmental conference on the illegal wildlife trade, which took place here in London three years ago, and there have been um, successor conferences to that in Botswana and Vietnam, and I also chair the United for Wildlife Task Force on the transportation industries and intercepting the, uh, uh, the shipment of illegal wildlife uh, goods, on which we're doing uh, a lot of work under the auspices of the Royal Foundation. A great deal is happening on this subject. There are many uh, experts and activists in this room. I can see around the room the IUCN conference took place in Hawaii a few months ago, the CITES conference in Johannesburg, uh, the Vietnam conference in November. There has been good news in tackling the illegal wildlife trade uh, just over the new year in the um, announcement by China of a total ban on ivory, uh, the ivory trade this year, uh, and details of how Hong Kong is going to set about that. The UK is going to host next year the next illegal wildlife trade conference. But amongst all that work, it's vital for people to have a good understanding and to, um, to know the facts, to know what we are dealing with. Otherwise, we will make mistakes uh, in how we go about it. We face a crisis in um, the impending extinction of species, as uh, many people here will know, appalling statistics on the poaching of rhinos, a 30% reduction in eight years of the savanna elephant population, increases in uh, seizures and poaching of tiger parts, uh, and many other uh, animals, some of which are mentioned in this uh, report. So I'm pleased that such expertise has been assembled in assembling this report to help us work out the next steps of what we have to do. And we have um, on our panel this morning uh, Professor Smith, a Professor of Strategic Theory and Head of the Department of War Studies at King's College, um, who's taken a particular interest in the impact of warfare on animals. Uh, we have Kathy Henlein, a Research Fellow in Rusi's National Security and Resilience Studies group where she leads on environmental crime. Uh, Stefan Crane is a consultant on wildlife protection strategies in Central Africa and currently the chief technical advisor in the Okapi Wildlife Reserve in the DRC. Uh, Professor Keith Somerville is senior research fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and teaches at the Center for Journalism at the University of Kent. He's done extensive research and writing about uh, human wildlife conflict in Africa uh, and the whole history of these uh, issues. And Dr. Tim Wittig is a scholar, practitioner, um, an educator <clears throat> in the fields of illicit trafficking and finance, uh, currently senior wildlife trafficking analyst with the Wildlife Conservation Society. He's previously worked with the U.S. Department of Defense. So we have a lot of expertise here. And the challenge for experts is always to explain everything in a few minutes uh, each uh, in order to uh, facilitate questions, which I know many of you will have. So I'm going to ask each of them to speak to us for a few minutes, starting with Professor Smith. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, William. Uh, so yes, we have a, a large panel, so I'm going to be very brief. Um, yes, I'm um, head of the Department of War Studies at uh, King's College London, and um, I'm just going to... Um, give you a very brief sort of um, um, assessment of really how the um, the, the Margin Centre for the uh, for the study of war in the non-human sphere and the Rusi Lake started to evolve, which is the basis um, of this publication. Um, and I'd start by saying that um, traditionally um, the study of war, something I'm obviously intimately sort of uh, associated with, has been um, conceived. Um, uh, traditionally, uh, as an entirely sort of human-centric phenomenon, um, you know, humans are seen as the principal causes of war, 
and as the principal victims um, of war. And the Marjan Centre for the Study of War in the Non-Human Sphere, um, it was started in 2010 to address a gap in the security studies literature, namely how war and conflict affected all the rest of life on Earth apart from humans. Um, put in that way, it seems a rather obvious area for research, but back then, and showing no disrespect to uh, my fellow security analysts and researchers, I think it was regarded as a bit of a curiosity lurking among all the hot-button subjects of terrorism, uh, nuclear proliferation, counterinsurgency, Afghanistan, topics all familiar to William Hague, I'm sure, in his days as Foreign Secretary. Um, conservationists we talked to also looked slightly askance at what we were proposing, which was not all that surprising, because traditionally, um, for both security analysts and conservationists, it was a case of the twain shall never meet. Um, conservationists mostly saw themselves, you know, in general, mostly saw themselves as about biodiversity protection and would perhaps rather not engage with wars and battles. Security analysts, on the other hand, saw the non-human realm as pretty marginal, if not irrelevant, um, to their thinking. And in fact, I don't think they thought about these things at all. Um, we are very fortunate that uh, in lurking over the garden fence, so to speak, from Rusi um, in Chatham House was Caroline Soper, who's just here, she's, you know, yeah. um, who was then editor of International Affairs. Um, and Caroline took the bold move to publish an article by uh, Jasper Humphreys um, and I that appeared in the January 2011 issue entitled uh, War and Wildlife, the Clausewitz Connection. And the thinking here was that by invoking the name of the great Prussian war theorist, we hoped that Caroline's readers would um, sit up and take notice. Um, well, in the intervening sort of six years or so, um, as uh, William Hague has just spoken uh, about, the world has really woken up to the horrors of the wildlife trade. Um, at the Margin Centre, we have uh, written a number of articles related to the nexus between security and wildlife, most notably focusing around issues related to the rhino horn trade, um, as the world has demanded ever more sophisticated and nuanced interpretations of this problem. Um, since then, of course, uh, the topic has very much moved to the forefront of public debate, uh, debate um, verified not least by you know, numerous uh, newspaper investigations, television documentaries, and not least the very high-profile interventions of members of the royal family. Um, in the endeavor to place the understanding of war and the non-human sphere further up the agenda, um, Marjan has undoubtedly benefited from all the energies of uh, my colleague, Jasper Humphreys, who's also sitting there in the audience, uh, one of the contributors to this Whitehall paper, who's very much the founding inspiration for the centre, as well as its, uh, much of its driving force. Also along with uh, Major General Peter Davis, who's formerly a prominent uh, animal welfare administrator and key motivator behind the beautiful animals of War Memorial in Hyde Park. Um, and he acted as the chairman of the Marjan Centre for over five years and is now its patron. And finally, during um, Marjan's short life, we were very, very fortunate to meet uh, Kathy, um, whom we first encountered when she produced the uh, excellent report with Tom McGuire on um, an illusion of complicity, terrorism, and the illegal ivory trade. And the link with Kathy provided the motivation to produce this Whitehall paper uh, with the very kind support of uh, Rusi, and which we hope will form the basis for further scholarly and public uh, policy studies in this field in the future. Um, that's all I want to say for now, um, and I'll hand over to William. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Kathy, you go ahead. Thanks. So I just want to very briefly do two things. Uh, firstly, to explain how this paper fits into Rusi's broader work on environmental crime, uh, and secondly, just to give a, an outline of the book and its structure before we hand over to our authors. So first, on Rusi's work in this area, uh, environmental crime has grown into really a major theme for us, sitting within our, uh, our broader organized crime portfolio. And over the last few years, we've expanded the range of research questions we're focusing on. And I'll just mention two other areas very briefly. Uh, the first is a project funded by DEFRA's IWT Challenge Fund, uh, the focus of which is on following the money linked to wildlife trafficking, which we see as a really a neglected area um, there's a tendency we found to, to stop at the seizure level and not to follow, not to look at the, uh, the valuable financial information that can help to build connections um, more widely in the trafficking chain. Uh, this project focuses on Kenya, Tanzania and Uganda and we're looking specifically at building capacity uh, amongst law enforcement in those countries to conduct financial investigations 
uh, in the course of wildlife crime cases. The second area we're looking at is illegal fishing. Um, this is a huge illicit industry. One in five fish are now thought to be caught illegally. Um, and there's still too often a tendency to consider this as just a niche regulatory issue. Uh, our study instead looks, as it looks at illegal fishing as transnational organized crime. Uh, and we also look at the overlaps with other forms of criminality like human trafficking. Uh, both of these projects will be launched in the spring, so we'll be sure to keep you updated on the key dates for those projects. Which brings us to the third key area, which is the Whitehall paper we're here to discuss. Uh, we've heard a little bit about the concept behind the paper, but basically the motivation uh, was the fact that as poaching and wildlife trafficking have expanded, there's been a lot of research into the impacts on biodiversity uh, and endangered species, and rightly so. But we felt that there'd been a, a real lack of research into the human impacts uh, and the impact on our security. The lack of research has resulted in a range of assumptions that have grown up and been repeated and reinforced in the media, uh, by researchers and by politicians. Um, but many of these are unproven. So we wanted to take these unproven narratives and look at the real evidence behind them. So we've organized the study basically into four parts, the, the four chapters in the book, uh, which cover four main areas, civil conflict, uh, terrorism, organized crime, and human security. On conflict, which Stefan will talk about, we look uh, basically at the narrative that wildlife is a conflict resource and that it can fuel and sustain uh, ongoing, ongoing conflict. Uh, on terrorism, which Keith will discuss, uh, the book looks at the narrative that poaching funds terrorism. And we also have Tom McGuire of King's College here who co-authored that chapter and he can uh, answer questions on that as well. Uh, on organized crime, which Tim will cover, the paper looks at the kingpin narrative um, and the idea that the trade is run by untouchables at the highest levels. And finally, on human security, uh, we look at the view that poaching happens mainly as a result of extreme poverty. Uh, and we have Rosaline Duffy here as, um, as the author, along with uh, Jasper Humphreys of King's College, uh, who can take questions on that. So I'll stop here and let the authors go into further detail. But thank you all very much for your interest in the, in the study. Okay, thank you, Cathy. So now the authors of each part of the book. Uh, Stefan, would you like to go first? Yes, uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, is there... There we go. So I will um, briefly explore the uh, complex realities of quote-unquote blood ivory based mainly on the uh, Central African Republic case study in the Tsanga Tsanga protected areas um, where I was working as a technical advisor for conservation for the WWF. I will also attempt to kind of draw some parallels with my current position as chief technical advisor in the Okapi Wildlife Reserve, both being World Heritage, uh, World UNESCO Heritage Sites in Peru. So to contextualize, DSPA was more of a post-conflict setting, whereas the Okapi Reserve can be considered a, a conflict zone. And in both cases, ivory harvesting, um, whether by armed groups being politically affiliated or not, is a threat to conservation and a threat to peace. So obviously, ivory really isn't uh, the sole source uh, funding of these conflicts, naturally. Uh, unfortunately, the problem is infinitely more complex than that. Um, as any multifaceted threat would be requiring catered multidisciplinary responses. So we observed that poaching did allow instability to endure in the Central African Republic, um, aggravating human security, poor governance, the trafficking uh, obviously of, of ivory weapons, ammunition, um, but also gold, diamonds, and timber. So I saw poaching more in this sense as an enabler, placing it more in the, uh, more in the, sorry, not as the center point, but more as the nebulous middle um, and is therefore much more convoluted. So while large-scale harvesting did slow down in the Central African Republic after the fighting stopped, regular organized uh, poaching operations remain quite prevalent, uh, providing funding to a plethora of actors, which are obviously are very difficult to identify in these areas. In DSPA in particular, um, the main characteristic, the characteristic threat is cross-border poaching, whereas in the Okapi Reserve, we're dealing with a far more militarized threat in the middle of uh, larger protracted conflicts. So though ivory does not necessarily imply war in every case, uh, it, obviously its importance can't be overstated or oversimplified. So in such zones, ivory poaching, the actual crime, um, allows instability to take root, 
um, and is more a means to an end rather than the core funding or the end game in itself. Now, it was and still is an easily accessible resource um, for what I call like second class insurgent groups um, in the DSPA in particular who don't necessarily have the political connections or the political agenda of large armed groups. So the particularity here in DSPA was that after the conflict, um, some Central African refugees merged in Cameroon with existing networks um, and provided uh, or created a more of a hybrid transnational threat um, and worked with proxies uh, with businessmen and politicians on both sides of the border. So Ivory Poaching then merged uh, with groups who really didn't really intentionally um, intend to poach but evolved out of the crisis filling a vacuum so to speak. Um, so in my opinion there was a higher portion of criminal actors rather than conflict actors in DSPA while I was there. Now, it is difficult to obtain accurate information not being on site. Yet these actors tend to merge in and out of the above categories, making it very difficult to, uh, to accurately, accurately identify um, uh, the, uh, the threat. Once they came back, these individuals, uh, they came back to Central Africa and mixed with warlords is when we really had a problem. Um, poaching, upgraded poaching parties would use AK-47s for their own protection. They would hunt with high caliber rifles and use shotguns as, uh, to poach for subsistence, making it quite complex to deal with. In comparison, in the Okapi Reserve, we're dealing, um, as I said, with much more militarized threat, and we make the distinction between rebels, um, poachers, and bandits, all of whom carry at least um, automatic weapons, sometimes belt-fed machine guns, or even RPGs. And they all use ivory at some point uh, for funding, be it opportunistically or systematically. So my work over there, um, uh, and to a certain extent in the Okapi Reserve, is at the center, is at the uh, point of the crime. Uh, evolving around denying the source of income for the sake of conservation, but ends up being some sort of a conflict resolution or prevention tool through internal DDR programs, um, uh, community conservation, obviously law enforcement, sometimes even uh, um, ecotourism, as was the case in DSP through guerrilla habituation programs. So the intersection between conflict and ivory, uh, just, um, how should I say, would imply thus an adapted approach. Uh, if it can be considered as low-intensity population-centric warfare, which I deem it is, then any multidisciplinary response must include a portion of perhaps counterinsurgency theory. When we're dealing with heavily armed men willing to kill humans to kill animals, then we must think pragmatically out of the box, especially in these sort of areas. And in a case in point, recently the UN did state that poaching is a threat to peace in such zones, sanctioning a co coercive approach um, to uh, conservation and conflict zones, however polemic that may sound to us today. And this intersection was illustrated very practically while I was there when we coordinated several operations involving MINUSCA troops, and as we speak, we're attempting to form a similar partnership with MINUSCO support in DRC. So as a practitioner uh, on the ground, we work with the means that we have um, and the manpower in often strenuous conditions, and uh, the, the counter-poaching concept that we're trying to uh, push forward um, aims to um, count, uh, compensate for uh, certain lackings and operates as a bottom-up rather than top-down methodology, combining soft and hard power approaches that we applied in DSPA and we're trying to push to a certain extent, as I said, in, in the Okapi Reserve. Um, in a nutshell, it, it kind of involves paramilitary tactics and um, law enforcement, which unfortunately have become mutually inclusive, and I do say unfortunately, but it is the case, um, as well as uh, combined as well as the programs I mentioned earlier. The key here is applying these tools jointly and simultaneously, um, and as such, we're not really reinventing the wheel. Rather, uh, the, the wheel. Sorry, rather, we are reassessing past past approaches. And I sincerely believe that this approach could frame the militarization of conservation that is already occurring, whether we like it or not, uh, in a way that's suitable both for conservation activities and the security needs for states, specifically again in these zones. Um, from a practical perspective. The result of poaching on the ground is devastating uh, for us working there and for the locals. A case in point, we lost four rangers um, who were killed in action in the Okapi Wildlife Reserve in the past year. So ivory is un thus undeniably a conflict resource, um, the proportion of which and the extent of which is the crux of what we try to examine here um, in this book and therefore should be um, examined in, in terms of practice as in a case-by-case -case basis in order to formulates any appropriate responses, uh, which is something that I hope my examples here today and in the book on Central African Republic um, and parallels drawn with DRC have illustrated today. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, let's move on to Keith. Thank you.
I'm going to have a look at the, the way the narrative of ivory and insurgency, of terrorism and particularly the ivory trade, grew up very, very quickly and became a dominant part of the discourse of security and the wildlife trade. Now, having, for a book I've just published, researched the history and political economy of the ivory trade stretching back for millennia, there has always been a link and remains a link between conflict, insecurity, and the opportunities to poach and to support not necessarily whole insurgent or political movements, but certainly feed resources into them through things like the ivory trade and to a much lesser extent for smaller groups, bushmeat and things like that. Perhaps the, the largest and, and first real indication of this link, if you didn't delve closely into the past history, was the South African UNITA link during the war in southern Angola, the civil war in Angola that involved the South Africans. And through the, the very brave role of people within the South African Defence Force, particularly Colonel Jan Breitenbach, who commanded 32 Battalion in southern Angola, it was found out that over a period of perhaps 12 to 15 years, 100,000 elephants had been poached to help support UNITA's war and also to provide money that was used for all sorts of nefarious purposes by the SADF and South African military intelligence. That was all brought out in the Conlaven report. But it was almost treated as a one-off. And then you got, five or six years ago, the emergence of the new narrative. And it had two starting points. One was the killing of 300 elephants in Buba and Jida Park in Cameroon in February 2012. 300 killed in a very short space of time, which indicated more than just small groups of poachers. And it was generally thought that this was the work of insurgent or militia groups of some sort. And the finger was initially pointed particularly at the Janjaweed from Sudan, who had become notorious during the Darfur conflict. Now, the Janjaweed aren't a militia or a movement in the sense that Al-Shabaab is and the Lord's Resistance Army are. They're almost a, a community that over centuries has involved themselves in trading, raiding, and hiring themselves out as irregular armed forces to all sorts of groups, and in Darfur to the Sudanese government. And they have a, tra a history and tradition of movement for trading, raiding, and poaching across Central Africa. So that brought one strain of security, militia, possibly terrorism links into the, the debate, the discourse about the wildlife trade. You then got what became the most powerful part of that narrative, which was the Al-Shabaab link. The idea that Al-Shabaab in Somalia were funding 40% of their military activities through the ivory trade. I was quite beguiled, I have to confess, by this report when it first came out, the reports. And you read it in the media, across media resources. It was brought up at a Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing in the States and documented in that. Many respected conservationists, like Ian Douglas Hamilton, appeared to support the idea that Al-Shabaab were closely involved in ivory poaching. When you began to look at it in detail, and Kathy and Tom have done this in great detail, as I was doing it independently, and we came to the same conclusions, that actually it didn't stack up. The idea that Al-Shabaab was trading between one and three tons of ivory every single month through Kenya, which would be between according to the figures that were given, that, that themselves seemed dodgy, that they were selling it for $200 a kilo, when in fact in China, at that stage, it was fetching between $1,000 and $2,000 a kilo. It seemed to be odd that they were selling it at a low price. The amount of ivory they were getting seemed to be questionable. And the fact that 
the, the amount of money they were making suggested they were getting the ivory for nothing. So were they poaching it directly? Did they have Al-Shabaab members who have been given over to poaching? When you began to look into it, you found it came down to one report, one single report by the Elephant Action League called, I think it was Al-Shabaab's White Gold. I managed, I could, wasn't able to speak to or meet directly the originator of the report, Andrea Croster, but I had a long email correspondence with him where the goalposts were moved each time I tried to pin him down on the collateral for this story. And it then turned out that the original report, based on infiltration of a smuggling group linked to Al-Shabaab, monitoring of phone calls, and then huge numbers of assumptions just didn't stack up in any way. And as I said to Croster in this exchange of emails, you're saying all the ivory comes from Kenya, is poached by Al-Shabaab. The amount of ivory that you are saying they are exporting every single month is well in excess of the figures from any of the conservation organizations about the number of elephants poached in Kenya. The Mike figures, the monitoring of illegal killing of elephants, they said Al-Shabaab's figures didn't stack up. When I spoke to Ian Douglas Hamilton, he began to question them. Ian Craig of the Northern Rangelands Trust wasn't convinced. Dan Stiles was incredibly critical, as were Lucy Vine and Esmond Bradley Martin. And as I looked into it, it became unrealistic. And Croster's answers to me and answers to follow-up questions suggested, in fact, this was an inflated story. And it became a perfect storm. Uhuru Kenyatta used this discourse to say the Westgate Mall attack was funded by ivory earnings. It's very, very questionable that there was a great link. Al-Shabaab may well opportunistically poach ivory. They undoubtedly tax ivory that passes through their territory. Though, of course, now they don't have the port that was said to be their port of exit to the, to the Gulf and the Far East for the task Kismayu, which is now in the hands of the Kenyan army. It doesn't stack up. So this part of the terrorism trade narrative doesn't seem to work very well. They may be involved tangentially. They may get some money from it. But the idea that al-Shabaab is funded to 40% of its activities between $200,000 and $600,000 a month from ivory didn't stack up. The other part of the ivory discourse relating particularly to to terrorism and security is the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army, pushed out of Uganda, now has a precarious, almost nomadic existence between parts of South Sudan, particularly the Garamba National Park and the DRC, areas of the Central African Republic, and their rather protected base at Kafia Kingi in this enclave contested by Sudan and South Sudan because of Kony and the LRA's long links to Sudan. It is clear the LRA poaches ivory. But the Enough Project, which the elephant researchers I've mentioned said to me, do seem to be very reliable on the LRA's poaching, suggests no more than 30 to 35 elephants a year. Now, that's clearly too many. You don't want them poaching that. But they are not major players in the illegal wildlife trade. And what my researchers have suggested is Conflict creates an opportunity for greater poaching. It reduces, as Stefan knows, the ability to regulate within protected areas. It makes wildlife and law enforcement bodies unable to deal with the threat in various areas. And it brings guns into those areas and pushes local people into greater destitution. All these things mean there is a link with insecurity, there is a link with conflict, but it is not this link that came out of the EAL, Janjaweed, and LRA narrative to begin with. It is there, but is only part of a very complex mix where I think corruption and organized crime are really the things that are at the center of it. They feed off the small-scale insurgency uh, link, but insurgency isn't driving the ivory trade, in my view. Thank you, Keith. So, finally, Tim. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for that great segue. 
um, yeah, so my, uh, the, the chapter that I, um, I authored on uh, in this book that we'll talk about is on the link between wildlife trafficking and organized crime. And uh, re in, in recent years, so one of the big uh, positive developments is that wildlife trafficking is now seen um, a wide consensus that it is a, a form of serious transnational organized crime, organized crime, there's organized crime involvement. It's being treated, I think, probably with the seriousness by law enforcement that, that it deserves. Um, but uh, despite this consensus on the fact of organized crime involvement or organized uh, wildlife crime, there's not, uh, we, there still are big knowledge gaps and some mythology probably about the exact nature of that involvement um, and uh, wildlife trafficking as an organized crime. So, so that's what this chapter uh, really talks about, tries to delve into that, uh, those issues. Um, some of the key findings, uh, two, two things. One um, is that wildlife trafficking does overlap with some other crime types, uh, organized crime types, other forms of organized crime. Especially, I would say, uh, especially it seems from the evidence available, uh, drug trafficking actually. <clears throat> so this is actually a uh, somewhat of a surprising um, finding and still needs to be uh, fleshed out a little bit more with, uh, with greater research. But, but there are um, major overlaps with, uh, with drug trafficking, uh, with uh, drug trafficking organizations sharing the same infrastructure, sometimes the same, sometimes uh, heroin traffickers, for example, in East Africa, uh, also shipping ivory. Um, dr drug trafficking organizations using wildlife as a, a counter-valuation um, mechanism, essentially to barter, uh, for example, wildlife products uh, for precursor chemicals um, from China. <laughs> and uh, yes, and also overlaps with human trafficking and, and some other crime types. And one of the other big findings that uh, the key findings that is discussed in the chapter is on the structure of these organized crime groups. Um, so there is, uh, I would say, probably a conventional wisdom um, that we're talking about kingpin-led organized crime groups. So essentially, vertically integrated uh, organized crime networks. So essentially, n not necessarily a formal, formally structured mafia, uh, but something where <coughs> you have a kingpin, uh, and then you have uh, uh, that, th that kingpin is exercising control uh, all the way down into the, uh, all, all the way down through the supply chain. But the evidence actually supports the opposite conclusion, um, that wildlife trafficking is probably a more horizontally integrated value chain um, with different organized crime groups at different levels. So you have uh, d um, upstream poaching gangs working with localized uh, ivory, for example, for ivory, uh, ivory procurement networks that are usually locally based, locally focused, politically connected at, at, at a more local level. Uh, then working with exporter export networks um, <clears throat> that are often politically connected at a, at a more national level. Uh, but one of the interesting things is that those um, downstream networks, the export networks, don't seem to have direct contact with the poaching networks. So what that means, so, the, so this carries some important implications. One, that uh, these uh, wildlife traveling networks are probably pretty sensitive to market changes, so changes in price. Uh, changes in um, availability, so, so they may leave the uh, leave the wildlife market if if the profitability is is lower. Um, it also means that probably the, as a targeting strategies, uh, kingpin oriented targeting strategies may not be the best approach. Uh, that maybe a mid level targeting strategy is, will be more effective against these networks. So what that means is that uh, by targeting the specialized logistical middlemen, uh, <coughs> then that may sever the link between the export uh, people and poaching uh, networks. So th this, um, and this actually is um, analogous to findings in, in some of other uh, analogous situations, including targeting uh, the Mexican drug cartels, where uh, f targeting um, highly specialized logistical providers of the cartels actually is more, uh, has been more effective at uh, diminishing their capabilities than arresting kingpins, which are easily replaceable, because there's always you know, a hundred people in line to be the kingpin. Uh, but <coughs> if you have a very specialized skill or you own uh, a boat or a plane or uh, you control a specific network that's a key uh, node, that's a much harder um, component of the organized crime network, the, the supply chain, value chain to replace. Um, and also from a law enforcement perspective, uh, that may be a better place to target informants because uh, 
uh, those middle, middle layers uh, have knowledge of both downstream and upstream. Um, so this is, uh, again, these are preliminary findings in the, in the chapter, so that need to be borne out with more, with more research, but um, it presents, presents them in detail. <laughs> 